and I'm going to formally introduce our speaker. So it really is my very great pleasure that Nosan Yanofsky from City University of New York has agreed to speak to us today on, as you can see from his title, self-referential paradoxes. So thank you so much, Nosan. Please do begin. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for inviting me. And Peter, thank you for, for bringing this all about. Can you hear me well? Am I too low, too low, high? Everything all right? I can hear you well, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so um, there's a lot to do this morning, so let, let's, let's get busy. So I'm going to read over my agenda, which is... Um, which is just the abstract, just to, to get a feel for it. So some of, my, some of the most profound and famous theorems in mathematics and computer science of the past 150 years are instances of self-referential paradoxes. Cantor's theorem that shows there are different levels of infinity, Russell's paradox that shows that simple set theory is inconsistent, Gödel's famous incompleteness theorem. Now I'm sure most of you have seen these things before and I'm not, I'm not trying to teach you anything new, the, the goal here is to show something about their relationship to category theory and to show the relationship with each other. Um, Turing's realization that some problems can never be solved by a computer and much more. Amazingly, all these diverse theorems can be seen as instances of a single simple theorem of basic category theory. We describe this theorem and we show some instances, okay? But you really do not need, uh, you don't need category theory for this talk. It's just about, for the most part, and I'll show you where it deviates, it's just about sets and functions. And so um, I wanted to, uh, so th that's what we're trying to do. Um, I have a hidden agenda here. So that was my agenda, but this is my hidden agenda. So I'm in the middle of writing this textbook. It's called Monoidal Categories, a unifying concept in mathematics, physics, and computing. And I have like 430 pages now, but um, one of the sections is this presentation, okay? And the, and the goal is to show that just with a, this is a section from chapter three. So it's an introduction to category theory. And just at the beginning, chapter three already, we're able to get all these things. And, and the goal of the book is to show the power of category theory and show that if you just do know a little category theory, you can learn a hell of a lot of mathematics, physics, and computers. Um, and the goal is to get you to buy the book and, and, and learn a little category theory and it'll improve your life immensely. Um, so that's the goal. Okay, so we're gonna do some uh, little preliminaries about some sets and then we're gonna go through three motivating examples very, very carefully, very, very slowly. We'll do a little philosophical interlude uh, in between that and then we'll go back to some of, our example, some of the examples with Cantor. And then I'm actually gonna give you that single simple theorem of category theory. It's, it's three, three and a half lines, you know, so it's, it's a simple idea and you'll, you'll see it. And we'll talk a little bit about Turing. I'm not gonna be able to get through everything, but um, whatever, the, the slides will be available or the talk will be available. And so you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see it. Okay, so let's, let's, go, let's go on. Before we leap into the examples, there are some technical ideas about sets. Two is the set of zero, one, which is gonna be true and false, okay? Then again, this is, everyone knows, let S be a set, a function G from S to two, uh, uh, we're gonna see this nomenclature over and over and over. A function G is a characteristic function and describes a subset of S, great. Consider a set S, uh, F from S cross S to two, what this should be thought of as comparing elements of S, okay? And the output is zero, one. Okay, and so we can think of f of a comma b, a and b are two elements of s, meaning a is a part of b or a is described by b. We're gonna see it in many different versions as we go along. Okay, continuing with the preliminaries, for any element s zero of s, consider the function f where the second input is always s zero. We say that s zero is hardwired into the function. So before f was of, function of two variables, and now we had just have a variable of one variable. You see my, my hand going up and down, right? My cursor, good. Okay, with only one pit, input. Since this function goes from S to two, it is also a characteristic function and describes a subset of S. The subset is those elements in S such that F of S comma S zero is equal to one. In other words, those things that are part of S zero or those things that are described by S zero. So that's what this function 
describes this this um, this characteristic function here describes. Okay, for different f's and various elements of s which are hardwired, there are different characteristic functions which describe various subsets. We now ask a simple question. Now you're going to see this phrase over and over. I'm going to ask a simple question over and over. And literally, there's there's not much content in this talk. It's just repetition. But the, the, the point of the talk is to show how it's all over. It's, it's ubiquitous. OK, we now ask a simple question. Given g from s to 2, OK, it's a characteristic function, and f from s cross s to 2, is there an s0 in s such that g characterizes the same subset of f comma s0? In other words, given this g and given this f, OK, can we find this S0 such that they're equal? Okay, do we state for a given G and F, does there exist an S0 such that G is equal to F? For which, if such an S0 exists, then we say G is represented by F. In other words, the subset G, the subset described by G is represented by this function F, okay? And this is going to be one of the main things. OK, great. So we now have all the, oh, one more part of the preliminaries. OK, for every set S, there is a, a map delta from S to S cross S called the diagonal map that takes an element T to an ordered pair, T comma T. This is the core of self-reference, OK? So now the way to think of it is as follows. I, I drew this, this crazy way in a, for a reason. S cross S to F, that's describing the relationship of different elements of, a, of S. And here we have S going to S cross S. So this takes every element T in S as follows. T goes to T comma T. That's here, here's a little element T. It goes to T comma T and then it evaluates it. So what we're doing is we're evaluating things on themselves, okay? Whereas this F evaluates things arbitrary two, two arbitrary elements, but the composition evaluates things on themselves. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. Okay, great. Okay, so now let's start these instances, these three motivating examples. And again, we go through this a little bit painfully slow. You've all seen the Bob uh, paradox, but I wanna go through it in four different ways so that we, 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 we get the feel for it and everything else basically falls into, into line similar to that. Bertrand Russell was a great expositor. The Baba paradox is attributed to Russell. He didn't really do it, but that's okay. They attributed to Russell and is used to explain some of the central ideas of self-referential systems. Imagine an isolated village in the Austrian Alps where it is difficult for villagers to leave and for itinerant barbers to come to the village. This village has exactly one barber and there is a strict rule that is, that is enforced. A villager cuts his own hair if and only if he does not go to the barber. If the villager will cut his own hair, why should he go to the barber? On the other hand, if the villager goes to the barber, he will not need to cut his own hair. This works out very well for the villages, except for one, for all the villages, except for one. Who cuts the barber's hair? If the barber cuts his own hair, then he is violating the village ordinance by cutting his own hair. And if he goes to the barber, well, then he's going to himself. And that's also not, that's not legal. So that's it. That's it. That's the barber paradox in English, and and it's a problem. Okay, and we'll talk about how to resolve the problem in a second. But I'd like to show you this this this. I'd like to formulate the barber paradox in another way. Okay, let us formulate this problem. Okay, let the set vill consist of villagers in the village, and then we have this function f, which describes how they related. It describes who's cut, who cuts whose hair in the village. It is defined by the villagers v comma v prime. And you have f of v comma v prime is equal to one or zero. One if v, if the hair of v is cut by v prime and zero if the hair of v is not cut by v prime. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a standard function which, which evaluates. We can now express the village ordinance by saying the following for all v. If f of v comma v is equal to one, in other words, if a villager cuts his own hair, if and only if f of v comma barber is equal to zero. Okay. In other words, if he doesn't go to the barber. Okay. This is true for all V, including V is equal to barber. In this case, we have this contradiction. F of barber comma barber is equal to one, if and only if F of barber comma barber is equal to zero. 
In other words, if he cuts his own hair, he doesn't cut his own hair. If he doesn't cut his own hair, he cuts his own hair. That's a contradiction. That's not legal. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much the barber paradox in sets. I'd like to get more categorical. And again, just building on what we just did. The diagonal set function delta from villages to villages across villages is defined as just pairs of it. Okay. And there's another function also two go not which goes from two to two which basically switches swaps um zero to one and one to two makes what was false into truth and what's true into false okay now we're going to compose these functions so let's just remember this this talks about self-reference okay when you have the self-reference and then you're going to compose that with the not okay so we're just taking two three functions and bringing them together and so we have not, um, not, okay? Now, when you compose that, you get a function like this, villages to two, which is a regular function, which describes a, which describes a characteristic function. It's a characteristic function that describes a set. So I'd like to see what this set, this subset of villages characterizes. Okay, so let's go through it. For a village of V, G of V is equal to, now we just compose those functions, delta F not. And we get not of F comma V comma V. So we get G of V is equal to one, if and only if, so this is equal to one, if and only if this is equal to one, just redid, redid that, okay? And when is this equal to one? Well, when F of V is comma V is equal to zero. That's what this not does. If not of something is equal to one, then it's equal to zero. This is if and only if the hair of V is not cut by V, okay? If V does not cut his own hair. So in other words, G of V is equal to one if and only if V does not cut his own hair. In other words, G is the characteristic function of all those villagers who do not cut their own hair. Very nice, okay? And we just did it nice, just about function composition. We now ask the simple question. We're gonna ask this question over and over. Can G be represented by F? In other words, is there a villager V0 such that G is equal to F of V0? In other words, is there some villager? Okay. It stands to reason that the barber is the villager who can represent G. After all, F of barber, this is all those people that are cut by the barber, describes all the villages who get their hair cut by the barber. So G of V, this is one if... This is one, that means he cuts his own hair if he goes to, if he, I'm sorry, this means he does not cut his own hair, means he goes to the barber. Okay, that's perfect for every villager. Okay, but what about V is equal to barber? And look what we have. G of barber is equal to barber comma barber. So if he does not cut his own hair, he goes to the barber. But by the definition of G, G of barber is not F of barber comma barber. That was from last slide. Okay, that was the definition of G. So on the one hand, we have G of barber is equal to it. On the other hand, we have it not. Okay, now that is not good. Conclusion, conclusion, the, here's a very important conclusion. The conclusion is that G is not represented by F. You cannot represent it. In other words, the set of all people who do not, the set of all villages who do not cut their own hair cannot be cut by someone in particular it cannot be the barber, okay? Okay, I wanna show you this in matrix form. So let's go through it. We saw it in words, we saw it in sets, we saw it in composition of functions for basically categories. And now I'd like to show it to you in matrix form and we're gonna need all of these. So basically, I don't know if the word cutter is a word. I don't know if cutty is a word. I, you'll forgive us people across the pond Okay, anyways, I made it up. Okay, so it goes as follows. Uh, it's a one and zero depending on V1 is, cu is cutting V5's hair. So he's not cutting it so that we put zero. V1 cuts their own hair. Now imagine for a second that this is a, a village. They're a finite set, okay? Ima imagine V4 is the barber, okay? So basically look what happens. If V1 cuts his own hair, that means he does not go to the barber. So this is zero. If V2 cuts, does not cut his own hair, then he goes to the barber. V3 
cuts his own hair so he does not go to the barber. Okay, um, let's do V5. V5 does not cut his own hair, therefore he goes to the barber. So the, what, the, what the ordinance says, what the rule says is that this diagonal, okay, which talks about everybody, whether they cut their own hair or not, okay, is the exact opposite of this column. This column is who, who goes to the barber, okay? So it's the exact opposite of this column. Again, this diagonal is the opposite of this column. And that's perfect, that's understandable, except at one place, right there, okay? Because the diagonal crosses the column, and so we have a problem here. How could this diagonal be the opposite of this column? And here's the problem, okay, it can't be. And so that, that expresses the Barber paradox in a simple, in, in, in a simple way, but we'll see this over and over. Okay, great. So we saw it in four different ways. We hate paradoxes, so we want to um, we want to we want to resolve it. We want to avoid contradictions. What is the resolution to this paradox? A any questions? Pop in. Okay. What is the resolution to this paradox? There are many attempts to solve this paradox, but they are not very successful. For example, the barber resigns as a barber before cutting his own hair. Okay, but that's not legal because there is exactly one barber in town, not zero barbers, can't do that. Okay, okay, the feminist response is the wife of the barber cuts the barber's hair. Okay, but that's not legal either because that would be there are two barbers in town. There's only one barber in town. Or the barber is bald, or the barber is a long haired hippie, or the rule is ignored while the barber cuts his own hair, etc. Okay, all these are way, all these are saying the same thing. The village with this important rule, this ordinance, cannot exist. Because if the village with this rule existed, there would be a contradiction. There are no contradictions in the physical universe. The only way the world can be free of contradictions if this proposed village with this strict rule does not exist. Okay, so that, 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 that gets rid of the barber paradox. And we'll see how we talk about it categorically later on. Okay, great. Now that we saw that, we saw the main idea, we're gonna see this main idea over and over. The paradox concerns, this Russell's paradox, this paradox concerns sets which are considered the foundations of much of mathematics. As is known, sets contains elements. The elements can be anything, in particular the elements can be a set, any, another set or it could be a set itself. The set containing itself is, a set containing itself is not as strange. Here are three examples of sets that contain themselves. The set of all ideas discussed in this talk, the set of the set that contains all the sets that have more than three objects, the set of abstract ideas. Okay, now, but you're you're going to yell at me that we're 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 calling this a set, and that's fine. You'll see how I get rid of that in a second. Okay, if you do not like sets that contain themselves, you might want to consider Russell's set, which is the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Okay, you don't like sets that contain themselves, so let's talk about the set R of all sets that do not contain themselves. Now ask yourself the simple question. Again, same, same phrase. Does R contain itself? In symbols, we're asking if R is a member of R, if R is a member of R. Let us consider the possible answers. If R is a member of R, then since R fails to satisfy the requirements of being a member of R, in order to be an R, you cannot contain yourself. So we get that R is not a member of R. Okay, so if it's in there, by definition, it's not in there. In contrast, if R is not a member of R, then R satisfies the requirement of belonging to R, and we have R as a member of R. This is a contradiction. Okay, great. So that's in English. Okay, now let's do it in categories. Basically, we have this function, we have this collection. Okay, I call it a collection called set. Okay, and F of set comma set cross set goes to two. Basically, we're going to evaluate F of S comma S prime, these are two sets. It's equal to one if one is a member of each other. It's equal to zero if they're not a member of each other. And now we have the same diagram again. And basically we're looking at those sets that are not contained in itself, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit quicker here, okay? G is gonna be the characteristic function of those sets that are not in itself, okay? And now we ask a simple question. Does there exist a set R such that G of G, set of all sets that don't contain itself, is contained in R? That is, we want this to be true. 
This means that R contains only the sets that do not contain themselves. The problem is that if such a set R exists, then we could ask about G of R. Okay, um, it's, the same, it's the same idea. Basically, G of R is equal to F of R R, okay? But by definition, G of R was not F of R R. And so we have this contradiction, okay? Let's do it in matrix form. We have all these subsets, I'm sorry, we have all these, we ask the following question. Is S3 an element of S2? No, it's not. Is S3 an element of S3? Yes, it is. So we negate it and we look at this. Now the diagonal here, the diagonal of this function is, well, it's gonna be one when there's zero here. So if S2 is not an element of S2, then we make it one. If S3 is an element of S3, then we make it zero. So the diagonal consists of all the elements. Sorry, the diagonal is the characteristic function of G, G characteristic function. And it consists of all the elements that are not elements of themselves. I'm sorry, it consists of all the sets that are not elements of themselves. Great, okay. The main point is, is that this diagonal set is not here, it's not the first column, it's not the second column, it's not the third column, it's not the fourth column, it's not the fifth column. Why? Because it's different here than the first column, it's different here than the second column, it's different here than the third column, it's different here than the fourth column. It was created to be different. Okay, Russell did this, creating it to be different. Okay, um, there's a little history to this. Russell got a Cantor came first, Russell knew about Cantor and um, followed along. Okay. Okay, the only way to avoid the, okay, great. So that explains it. We did it in different ways. We wanna avoid it. The only way to avoid this contradiction is to accept that the function G cannot be represented by any element of, it, of set. This translates in meaning that the collection of all sets that do not contain themselves does not form a set, okay? So set there is say, this is a class, that's fine, but that's fine. It's hard to know what the, I mean, the distinction between class and set is somewhat I don't know, I don't like it. Okay, this is collection is not an element of set. While such a collection seems to be a well-defined notion, I can define it very well. I can tell you what a set, you know, what this R set is, it's perfectly legitimate in English, but we have shown that if, that if we say that this collection is an element of set, then there's a contradiction. Okay, one more motivating example. This is from this is called Grelling's paradox or heterological paradox. And it goes, it's all about adjectives, words that modify nouns. So English is English. French is not French. Francois is French, is Francois. German is not German. Deutsch is Deutsch. Abbreviated is not abbreviated. I wrote it out and checked the spelling. Unabbreviated is unabbreviated. Hyphenated is not hyphenated. Okay, great. So. And these are just some examples of adjectives, and we ask whether or not they describe themselves or not. Call all adjectives that describe themselves autological. In contrast, all adjectives that do not describe themselves as heterological. Okay, and so we have this nice little classification. Whoops. English is describes itself. A noun is a noun. Unhyphenated is unhyphenated. Unabbreviated is unabbreviated polysyllabic made of many syllables is polysyllabic okay in contrast monosyllabic is not monosyllabic a verb is a verb is a is a type of word so it's a noun a verb is not a verb a verb is a noun german is not german french is not french and non-english is not non-english non-english is a perfectly legitimate english sentence so uh, a English word. Okay, so we have this nice, neat classifications of different types of, of, of things. Okay, good. Let us ask a simple question. Is heterological heterological? Okay, so let's go through it. If heterological is not heterological, then it does not describe itself, and therefore it is heterological. If heterological is heterological, then it does describe itself, and therefore is not heterological. It's a contradiction. Okay, we do the same thing. We take all the adjectives, two minutes to the break. We take all the adjectives, okay, 
and we compare them to itself. And we say a comma a prime, if a is described by a prime, if a is not described by a prime, okay? And now we do this same stupid picture again and again, namely, talk by itself, evaluate, negate its evaluation, and g becomes the characteristic function of all the adjectives that do not describe themselves. Now we ask a simple question, can g be represented by some element of adjectives, in adjectives? And the answer is no. Okay, and the same thing again, g of heterological, a g of a, if it was, then we should call that word heterological. Heter, g of heterological is f, but by definition, g was defined as not, we get a contradiction. Okay, and again, we can do it in matrix form. I don't have to do it. Um, you have a, the set and it's gonna be, one set is gonna be across like this and one set's gonna be across like this and it's gonna be zeros and ones. Okay, avoiding contradictions. How do we avoid this little paradox? Okay, there are two possible ways of avoiding it. Many philosophers say that the word heterological cannot exist. I think I once checked to see if it's in the Oxford English Dictionary and I think it's, it's there as a paradox, but not as a word. Okay, uh, so it, it cannot exist. After all, we just showed that if it is not always well-defined. I can't say if heterological is heterological, and so it's not well-defined in that sense. Another more obvious solution is to just ignore the problem. Okay, English majors and librarians have trouble with this. They don't, uh, Grelling was a librarian that was friendly with uh, Russell. So um, that's where it comes from. Another more obvious solution is just ignore the problem. Human language is inexact and full of contradictions. Every time we use an oxymoron, we are stating a contradiction. Every time we ask for another piece of cake while lamenting the fact that we cannot lose weight, we are stating a contradiction. We can safely ignore the fact that heterological is, well, is not well defined for certain, for, for, one, for one adjective, okay? And just ignore it. Okay, so that's a way of getting rid of the contradiction. Okay, so uh, I think we should take a five minute, uh, as long as you want, uh, fill it before we get to the philosophical interlude. Sounds good? Okay, oh, okay, so. There's three math at least three mathematical physicists, by the way. Okay, oh, so sorry, Bernard. <laughs> I have speak of you. I can't see everybody. I apologize. <laughs> I can also see Stefan now. Actually, I must put you back on the uh, speak of you. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's just um, let's just. Uh, there's too much math in here, so let's just go a little bit of philosophy oh, and. Uh, well, okay, fine. A paradox is uh, we're not we're not we we get along with everybody. A paradox is a process where an assumption is made and through valid reasoning a contradiction is derived. The logician then concludes that since the reasoning was valid and the contradiction cannot happen, it must be that the assumption was wrong. So if you're going to start with an assumption and get a contradiction and you do it legitimately, then there must be something wrong with the contradiction. This is very similar to what mathematicians call proof by contradiction and philosophers call reductio ad absurdum. A paradox is a method of showing that an assumption is not part of rational thought. So it's a way of showing that this is false. Okay, we have seen so far seen the same pattern of proof in three different areas, villagers, sets, and adjectives. The assumption is that G, that the G function can be represented by the F function. Contradiction is then derived and we conclude that G is not, okay? Um, G, G is not represented and this is where you get uh, okay, but these three area, these three examples show three different areas where contradictions can occur. So what is the physical universe? A village with a particular rule is part of the physical universe. The, the physical universe does not have any contradictions. Facts and properties simply are, okay, with apologies to any physicist there. Facts and properties simply are, and no object can have two opposing properties. Whenever we come to such con contradictions, we have no choice but to conclude that the assumption was wrong, okay? Because we don't have contradictions in the physical universe. In contrast, the mental and linguistic universe, in contrast to the physical universe, the human mind and human language that the mind uses to express itself are full of contradictions. We are not perfect machines. We have a lot of different contradictory parts and desires. Remember the part about the cake? I'm, I didn't eat breakfast yet. We, are all we all have conflicting thoughts in our head and these thoughts are expressed in our speech. 
So an assumption brings when an assumption brings us to a contradiction in our thought or language, we do not need, need to, to take it very seriously. If an adjective is in two opposing classifications, it does not really bother us. In such a case, we cannot go back to our assumption and say that it is wrong. We just ignore the, the entire paradox can be ignored. Okay, great. In contrast to that, science and mathematics, this is just to upset some philosophers, so there are, however, parts of human thought and language which cannot tolerate contradictions, science and mathematics. These areas of exact thought are what we use to discuss the physical world and more. If science and math are to discuss, describe, model, predict the contradiction-free physical universe, then we better make sure that no contradiction occurs there. We, must, we first saw this in the early years of elementary school when our teachers proclaimed that we are not permitted to divide by zero. Since math and science cannot have contradictions, young fledglings, those are the people you sent off to school two minutes ago, are not permitted to divide by zero. To summarize, science and mathematics are products of the human mind and language, and language which we, which we do not permit, the human mind and language, uh, which we do not permit to have contradictions. If an assumption leads to a contradiction in science and math, we better stop it, okay? We, we exclude it, okay? And so we have this thing. This is clean of contradictions. The mental and linguistic universe does have contradictions. Science and math better not have contradictions because we're gonna use this to describe this, okay? So we have this three part things and this shows up over and over. In every paradox, I'm gonna ask, is this part of science and math? So we have to artificially exclude it, okay? Is this part of the physical universe? We have to, um, there can't be contradictions. I'm not really gonna talk about uh, mental and linguistics problems, but uh, we have that. Uh, well, we did one, okay. Continuing in the philosophical interlude, the question is why the hell do this in category theory? These, these paradoxes have been around for so long, why talk about it in category theory, okay? Okay, and the answer is as follows. Many have felt that these different instances of self-references have a similar pattern, okay? Bertrand Russell supposedly inventing the Barber paradox to show Russell's paradox, okay? But what, what, what category theory does is he doesn't just, you have the feeling that, oh, they're all self-referential paradoxes. It actually gives a formalism to show this. And this was done by L William Levere, who's one of, the found, one, of the, one of the founders, one of the leaders in category theory. He did this in 1969 to show this single formalism that describes all these different things, okay? This also shows the unifying uh, this shows that logic of the logic of self-referential paradoxes is inherent in many systems, and this also shows the unifying power of category theory. Okay, there's another philosophical reason why we do this in category why why we do this in category theory. There is, however, another positive aspect of our formalism. Levere showed us how to have an exact mathematical description of the paradoxes while avoiding messy statements about what exists and what does not exist. In the categorical setting, the Barber paradox does not say that a village with a rule does not exist. We just say that the function G cannot be represented by the function F, okay? In other words, we say that the villager, the Barber villager doesn't fit into, fit into the rest. With Russell's paradox, a category theorist does not say that a certain collection does not form a set. It's a well-defined well -defined thing. Why, why is one set not, why do we have to use the word class, okay? It shows why it cannot be done. In the heterological paradox, we avoid the silly analysis as to whether a word exists or not, okay? We're not talking about whether it exists or not. We're just saying it doesn't fit into this, um, it fits into this mathematical thing, and this is a problem. In our categorical discussion, we successfully avoid metaphysical gobbledygook, okay? And for this alone, uh, the categorical version should be appreciative appreciate it. Okay, let's talk about Cantor. So that's the end of the philosophy. I hope I didn't upset people, but usually everybody gets angry. Don't get angry. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just words. Okay, um, so I'd like to talk about Cantor because we have to build up this, this idea um, a little bit more to more general. So Cantor showed this different size of sets. He showed that every set is smaller than this power set. I'd like to say that four different ways so that we can get it to the right way. Every set is smaller than the power set P, P, 
the power set P of S. A more categorical way of saying it is that for any set S, there cannot exist a surjection from S onto the power set. In other words, if this guy is bigger than this, there's no surjection. Yet another way of saying this is that for every purported surject surjection, H from S to P of S, there is some subset of S denoted C. It's going to depend on H. Okay, it's going to be the certificate that shows that this function is not onto, it's not surjected. Okay, this is proven with a proof by contradiction. We are going to assume wrongly that there is uh, such a surjection and derive a contradiction. Since this is formal mathematics, so this is that third part about formal mathematics, we can, no contradiction could be acceptable. And so we say there is no surjection like this. I just want to say historically, this go. This is the first thing. This is Cantor, which is the 1890s. But in some sense, uh, this goes back to Epimenides. You know, to 2,400 years ago, uh, the liar paradox is also part of this um, formalism. Okay. Well, we do it again. We we have a value. It's the same picture over and over. We have this function that takes s and s two elements of s. Okay, S and S prime, and we have one if S is a member of a, a H of S prime, and zero if is a, if it's not a member. In other words, if it's in the image, then we compose as always, and we have G of H. G of H is the characteristic function of the subset C of H, where elements S does not belong to H of S. Okay, and there I write it out as sets. Okay, so it's the characteristic function of those elements that are not in their own image. Okay. And we get a contradiction. Okay, we claim that the subset C of H of S is not in the image of H. C of H is a witness or certificate that H is not surjected. If C of H was in the image of H, there would be some S0 such that H of S0 is equal to C of H. In other words, if you can tell me it's surjective, then there's some input that gives it. In that case, G, G of H would be the rep represented by F of H with S0, so we would have this. So again, S0 contains all the elements and S, S0 contains C of H, okay? So this is exactly saying, if G of H is the characteristic of C of H, that says that. However, this would be true for all S, including S0, and so we would have that. However, by definition, G of H is, G of H is defined as not like that. So again, we get to the contradiction. Okay, this is part of mathematics and only and the only resolution is to accept the fact that no surjection H exists, okay? And that S is less, there are fewer elements in S than P of S. For finite sets, this is obvious. The number of elements in, set, in a set S is N implies that the number of elements in the power set is two to the N. But for infinite sets, we have this hierarchy of infinite sets. This is definitely different than this, is definitely different than this, is definitely different forever and ever, okay? So we have this, this hierarchy of unequal sets, okay? Okay, I'd like to do the Cantor's other inequality because this, this shows something else, okay? Basically, we're trying to show that the natural, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker here because uh, we have 15 minutes. The natural numbers are smaller than zero, one, than the interval from zero to one. In order to do this, instead of talking about the set two, which is just has zero and one, we're gonna have the set of digits from zero to nine. And instead of talking about this not function that swaps the two, okay, swaps true for false, we're gonna have this alpha function, which basically changes its input. Alpha of zero is one, alpha of one is two. Okay, and this is a nice function that does it. Not interested in this particular function, you, there's, there's 10 factorial different functions that do this. Okay, but the most important thing is that the input is different than the output. You'll see this in a second. Okay, and now I want to describe, you give me a purported surjection of the natural numbers onto the interval zero, one, and I'm going to show you that that purported surjection is not a surjection. Okay, so I'm going to find you a number here that doesn't get hit by this function h. Okay, and the way I do it is this f of h. And f of h just says, you know what? You give me a number n. You give me, you want to know what the mth digit of that number m? Okay, well, this function gives that out. So let's do this. f of h 
takes two integers and it gives you the nth digit of h of n. Okay, this is why it's dependent on h. Okay, so you'll see this in a second because we're going to have this. So basically, what this does is here's the real numbers. Okay, it's got read down. Here's one real number between zero and one. Here's another real number between zero and one. Here's another real number between zero and one. And here's the digits. And my goal, my point is that these are the natural numbers and they correspond in a one to one fashion. They're onto function from the natural numbers onto the real numbers. Okay, let's just go up again. Okay, that just explains that picture. Guess what we do? The same stupid picture again. You ready? Natural numbers, we look at the nth number, we look at the nth number, the nth digit of the nth number, and guess what we do? We find out that digit and then we change it, okay? Now that G of H is no longer, we can't talk about characteristic functions anymore because we're not going to two, we're going to 10. The function G of H also depends on H, okay? And you have the H is defined in there. And the next matrix will help explain the function G of H. Basically, here it is. I'm changing this number, I'm changing this number, I'm changing this number, I'm changing this number, I'm changing, whoops, changing a lot of numbers, okay? And the point is, this number that's described by the output of alpha, the output of alpha, that number is not on this column, it's not on that column, it's not on the second column, it's not on the third column, it's not on the fourth column, it's not on the fifth column. It doesn't exist. It's not on your list that you thought you had. Okay, it's not on the list. Okay, so that number described by G of H, we'll call it capital G of H, is not on your list of any of, of your purported list. Okay, so it's not there. Now we could say this self referential things as follows I am not, this G of H is kind of a number which says the following I am not on column N because my nth digit is different from the nth column, the nth column's nth digit. Another way of saying this is, I am not in the image of H. That's what this function, this number is saying. Again, this self-reference comes in. Okay, here we formally do it again about representations. And we have this, we have on the one hand, G is equal to F, it's represented. On the other hand, it's defined by alpha. So it's not, it's not there. Okay, and so the only way to get rid of this is to say that these two sets, there is no surjection like this, and these two sets, this set is actually smaller than that set. Okay, I'd like to go to the main theorem in category theory. Since this is a talk on category theory, I would like to do this, but first some prelimin preliminaries. A simple definition in set, the category of sets. Consider a point, a set, consider a set Y and a function alpha from Y to Y. We say that S0 is a fixed point of alpha if Alpha of F0 is equal to S0. The input is the same as the output. Okay, great. Now I'd like to talk about that as, as sets. And so we say as follows. We pick out an element in Y with this function from the one element set. We say P of star is equal to S0. Okay, now what does it mean to be a fixed point? Look what's happening here. You have the one element set picking out an element. You have a one element set going to the same element. If alpha takes that one element set to that one element set, that's a fixed point. Great. Now that we have this definition in set, let's look at it in, in categories. Let us generalize this to any category A. Whatever a category is, just think of a category as a lot of things with maps in between them. Okay, and a terminal object, that's gonna play the same role as this. We say we have, okay, I'm gonna read this a little bit quickly, but we have alpha composed P is equal to P, that's a fixed point. We're interested in when we have fixed points and when we don't have fixed points, okay? And now here's this Levere's theorem from 1969. Okay, let A be a category, collection of objects and morphisms with a terminal object and a binary product. Let Y be an object that's, Y be an object in the category and alpha from Y to Y be a morphism in the category, okay? So we set up everything that we have. If alpha does not have a fixed point, then, Okay. In other words, that's what we always were dealing with the entire time. The not function swapped the ele elements. That Cantor function that took the digits and changed the digits, it swapped it. It made sure there's no fixed point. 
If alpha does not have a fixed point, then for all objects A and for all evaluating functions like we have there, there exists a G from A to Y such that G is not representable by F. Now that's not understandable by itself, okay? It's, a, it's you know, got a little lot of different parts, but we saw it in five different ways so far, and we're gonna see it in a few more ways in a few minutes, okay? So now it's kind of understandable, okay? Now that's the theorem, and guess what? The proof is, the proof is that same thing, okay? G is not representable by F, we've done it a million times. We're bored of it. I'm not going to approve in the talk, but it's the same. It's the same thought. Okay. Um, so let me just go through this, uh, the rest a little bit quickly. Turing's halting problem is the same type of thing. Okay. Turing's halting problem basically says that you cannot write a program that's going to determine whether or not another program with another input halts or goes into an infinite loop. Okay, so this is from 1936. And basically you can see the self-reference right to there. From this an exact statement of, of you have programs talking about programs, you have the self-reference. Programs deciding properties about programs, that's no good. Okay. Um, this is restate, I'm just restating it. You, you wanna know if something goes into an infinite loop or not. Okay. And the way you, you would think, oh yeah, I can write a program that would do this. And you have this halt program. This is our F, okay? And basically it takes up two numbers. N is a number of a program. M is an input. If it halts, it outputs a one. If it doesn't halt, it outputs a zero. Okay, that's good, okay? The only problem is this doesn't exist. That's what the whole purpose here is to show you that this function cannot exist. Or I'm sorry, the function exists, but it's not a computable function. Uh, God knows the answer to this function, not any human being, okay? Okay, and so we would have this. We'd have programs, we'd have input to the programs, and we'd have a bunch of ones and zeros. Well, guess what we're gonna do next? We're gonna swap the diagonals. We're gonna change the diagonals, okay? And we get this thing. Now, rather, it's a little bit more complicated. Rather than just making it zeros, what we do is we put it into an infinite loop because that's what we're trying to show, okay? And guess what? This program that's down this thing, this diagonal, is different than this program. It's 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 different than that program. Conclusion, this program down the loop, down the diagonal, is not a program, okay? It's not a computable program. It's not on this list. It can't be on this list. Okay, and so it's it's not there. Okay, so again, it's a self-referential thing and it's done the same way. The program is in some sense self-referential in the following sentence. The program does, what this program, that diagonal does is the following. If you, it's a computer program that does the following. If you ask me whether I will halt to go into an infinite loop, then I will give you the wrong answer. Okay. That's that swapping over here along the diagonal. Swapping along the diagonal means giving you the wrong answer. Okay, computers do not give the wrong answer. No computer ever gave the wrong answer. Computers do exactly what human beings tell it to do or what, yeah. The, the problem with computers is they don't do what we want them to do. We, they do what, they t what we tell them to do, okay? Now a computer cannot give the wrong answer. Conclusion, this program cannot exist. It's not a computable program. Okay, and also halt cannot exist. Okay, um, let's just mention that there's a contrapositive of the Lebesgue theorem, which is the only difference is is there it's it's equivalent, and this is a question of whether or not there are fixed points. Okay, and this is used in logic. Okay, basically, it, uh, just to give the intuition, if you have the diagonal is the same as something is representable. If the diagonal is representable, then at some point where they cross, you're gonna have what's called a fixed point because these are all the Fs and these are all alpha of them. And so you're gonna have alpha of FPP is equal to FPP. So that's FPP is a fixed point of L. So we get these fixed points. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to go through this. I, I'm gonna skip most of this, but this is all about logic. 
And the point is, you have logical sentences which can be described by numbers, logical sentences about numbers which are described by numbers. So there you have again the self reference. Okay. And basically, using that fixed point, using those fixed points, you can formulate that for a given logical property, you can make a sentence C such that E of C, of the number of C, is equal to C, is equivalent to C. And what this basically says is C is a logical sentence that says, I have property E. Okay, it's done the same way with F and G and diagonals. And we come to Gödel sentences. Gödel basically described the way of describing E of X, says, for all Y, it's not provable. Y is not a proof of X. Well, great. Let's find a sentence that's equivalent to that. So we're going to have a G for girdle of E of G. And basically this says for all Y, it is not provable that G is a proof. Okay, G is a logical statement that says, I am a statement for which any Y is not a proof of me. Okay, In other words, I am unprovable. So again, it comes into the same thing. Now just think about this statement, I am unprovable. If it's true, then he's unprovable. If it's false, well, then you're proving a false statement. You can't prove a false statement. Okay, so before Gödel came around, there were true sentences. Everyone thought that, well, many people thought that true is equal to provable. Gödel came along and said, no, no, no. There's true sentences, and there are provable. And here's his Gödel sentence, which is true, but not provable. Okay, so that's the main idea. Tarski has another thing, which is basically, I am not true, which is the liar paradox in logical form. And Rohit Parikh has an interesting paper, fascinating paper, and he talks about not proof, but length of proofs. And he's basically formulates, using the same material, this is 1971, um, a logical sentence, CN, N depends on how long, I do not have a proof of length less than N. And he gets some very interesting statements about logical proofs. Okay, don't want to talk about Epimenides, but I just want to talk about one other, namely, since we have so many physicists here, let's talk about time travel. If time travel was possible, the time traveler might go back in time and shoot his bachelor grandfather, guaranteeing that the time traveler was never born. Homicidal behavior is not necessarily to achieve such paradoxical results. The time traveler might just go back and make sure his parents never meet. So this is um, Back to the Future movie. Or he might just simply go back in time and make sure that he does not enter the time machine. If he doesn't enter the time machine, then he can't stop himself from entering the time machine. Okay. These actions would imply a contradiction and hence cannot happen. The time traveler should not shoot his own grandfather moral reasons notwithstanding, because if he shoots his own grandfather, he will not exist and will not be able to travel back in time to shoot his own grandfather. Okay, so the idea is as follows. Usually events affect other events. If I, if I uh, let go of my phone, it's gonna fall. It's one event affecting another event, okay? What's going on with time travel paradox is one event affecting itself. And since we can't have that, um, that's fine. One event can affect itself, but we can have an event negatively affecting itself. And so we get the same thing. We have the set of all events. This is what physicists study, the set of all events. Okay. And we have question, does E affect E prime? And we can talk about space cones and, and space time warps, whatever, and what can affect each other and what can't. Okay. And basically we talked about G is the characteristic function of those events that negate themselves. And those things cannot exist, okay? And so we have this. Okay, fine. Um, so self-referential paradoxes somewhat fit into this uh, paradigm also, but not totally, and you'll have to see why. Okay, so let's just go through where, you, where, where this all comes from. This all comes from Levere's paper in 1969. Levere wrote a popular, well, well uh, an introduction to category theory called conceptual mathematics, and he visits this idea again. In a, in a more readable way. Uh, he also wrote with someone else another book called Sets for Mathematics, and he visits this again. Parikh, with those interesting sentences, um, he has this, po this paper called Existence and Feasibility in Arithmetic. I just wanted to bring that in. Okay, my little fledglings are getting up. Anyways, um, I wrote a paper in 2003 
a universal approach to self-referential paradoxes, fixed points, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what this says is, basically this paper made this theorem understandable for non-category theorists. We just talked mostly about sets and I have not six, I had 19, in, I have in this paper, 19 instances of this all over in math and in computer science and well, a little bit slightly, well, just that self-referential paradox is about uh, time travels uh, for physicists, okay? Um, I also wrote this book, okay? Um, the Outer Limits of Reason, What uh, Science, Math, and Logic Cannot Tell Us. This is a popular science book, um, which talks about some of those um, paradoxes also. There's a British journal called Philosophy Now. It's a philosophy magazine called Resolving Paradoxes. And that's where I talk about these three different places, the physical universe, the mathematical, the linguistic and mental part and math and science. And um, these three page paper that talks about how certain paradoxes are in each one of these things and where we get this. And here's another paper, which I, it's an American scientist, more scientific rather than uh, philosophical. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Any questions, any unhappiness, any discussions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For such an entertaining and wide ranging talk, Nosson. That's excellent, thank you. I'm just gonna stop recording now and then people can jump in with whichever questions they, they, they wish to ask. Okay, thank you.